opposite direction, we'll be doubling our search efforts. Should I even try to link up? I mean, it's not like we form a proper sabbat. Maybe we should just leave it at doubling the search. I thought about it for a moment. Compromise. Head in my direction, and if we do link up, we can make a decision. If one of us turns up something specific regarding Bender's location, we'll reevaluate. Good enough, Hugh stood. I guess we're winging it again. He winked out. I spent several mills staring at the space where he'd been sitting. Souls. Life after death. I wondered if, after all these years as a humanist, I'd end up eating my words. 6. The War Heats Up Bill, July 2334, Vert Things are getting a lot more interesting, Garfield said without preamble as he popped in. I turned and gave him the side eye. Gar was turning this unexpected popping in thing into a habit. Maybe it was the stress. I hoped so. I didn't want to have to make a big deal out of it. How so? I don't think Starfleet took into account the reaction of humanity in general. I think humans are looking at it like being snubbed because there's a whole I got you no contact with humans right here vibe going on. Any assets that any member of Starfleet might have had are being frozen. Agreements are being canceled. Their access is being removed for everything. And even in systems that weren't affected by the network attack, they're being denied access. Basically, the entire infrastructure of human space is now being closed off to them. I thought about that for a second, then laughed. Their mission statement is to end contact with bios in general, but I think maybe they were planning on doing it on their schedule. Like when you give your employer two weeks' notice and they say, no, that's okay, leave now. Yep. And several systems have kludged together temporary comms stations, then immediately gone and taken down the originals until they can clean them out. Bandwidth suffers, of course, but for Starfleet, it drops to a big zero. As the number of available routes shrinks, we're able to come closer to pinpointing Starfleet's center of operations. They have an actual center? Well, they're pretty distributed, but the individual subgroups aren't very effective once they've been cut off from the collective. Most of Starfleet activity does appear to be coming from comm nodes in the direction of the Perseus Transit, which jibes with my original estimate. But they'll rebuild their comms stations as well. Eventually, we'll end up with two independent but overlapping networks. If they don't have a physical presence, they won't be able to, Garfield argued. How are they going to rebuild? No one's going to rent printer time to them. They'd have to fly someone in and then trust that whatever they build won't get shot out of the sky. He had a point. Yeah. I don't think there will be a lot of tolerance for Starfleet equipment, Garfield nodded. And assuming we are reduced to physical violence, we can expect a lot of hit and run. One thing we Bob's proved is that you can't maintain physical border security in interstellar space. Notwithstanding the Battle of Seoul, which only worked out because we knew the others were coming. That may not be viable in the long term, Gar. Imagine years and years of a running guerrilla war. We may have to clean house. 7. The Battle of New Home. Claude. July 2334, New Home Colony. I examined the battle status graphics, searching for weaknesses. Commander Hobart stood at parade rest with that peculiar ability of the military to just go into mental hibernation when waiting. I found it ironic that he did a better impression of a machine than I would ever manage. I could leave my Manny parked under AMI control, but that would be cheating. I think we're covered, Commander. I shifted to face him, and he came to life. Then we're ready to go. Hobart touched the emblem on his chest. Miller, commence operation. I suppressed a snicker. Apparently without any irony, the new home military had adopted a comm system very similar to TNG. I'd questioned Hobart about it without being obvious. I hope. And he'd displayed no knowledge of the existence of Star Trek, let alone of the blatant borrowing. No double chirp, though. That would have been too much. Lieutenant Miller, somewhere in the vast maze that was the new home military, would now be giving orders and activating equipment. As always, when I took the time to think about it, I found myself mildly surprised at the size of the military presence 
in the Gamma Pavonis system. Of course, New Holm was founded when we were still not sure if the other's threat was over and the attitude had stuck. Maybe in a few more generations it would fade, but for now, New Holm society was like a porcupine, perpetually on full alert. Today we would be going up against the Starfleet incursion in the system. Starfleet had taken over the local relay station and one of the two space-based auto factories, then contacted New Holm to negotiate an agreement. From other negotiations with Starfleet, we had a pretty good idea of what they wanted. Agreement in principle that humans and replicants should go their separate ways. Agreement that there would be no contact with pre-industrial species. And agreement that interaction with post-industrial species would be kept to a minimum to avoid cultural contamination. In the face of it, the deal points didn't sound like much. In return for nothing except a bunch of signatures, essentially. Starfleet would hand back control of the equipment. Except that no matter how you phrased it, it was still extortion. Humans had never taken extortion well at best, and New Holm society came nowhere near to at best. They hadn't even bothered to respond. Three minutes, Miller's voice said from midair. Hobart nodded in satisfaction, still at parade rest. As I watched, the little icons crawled across the graphic as the military units approached their targets. You have one hour to reacquire the space station, Claude, he said to me. This wasn't news to either of us. It was just Hobart making what he no doubt thought of as conversation. The nuclear device will be put in place immediately pending results. Understood, Commander. I doubt you'll need the nuke. My understanding is that failure on our part will result in a self-destruct. Hobart smiled, but didn't reply. The assaults were timed so that we would intercept the autofactory and space station at the same moment. We wanted Starfleet's attention to be divided. Not that it would make a ton of difference, but every little bit helped. No sign of resistance yet, Miller said. Odd. Hobart frowned. They've had control of the autofactory for two days now. Shouldn't they have been able to construct at least a few of your busters by now? Yes, Commander, and they should have launched... Bogies detected, Miller interjected. That's more like it. Hobart tapped his emblem. Details, please. Busters, from the look of it. Twenty. Straight attack vector, no subtlety. Hobart gave me a perplexed look. You gents tend to be tricky as a rule, but that sounds like the maximum they could have built in the available time. Any chance there's a fake of some kind? I don't see how, Commander... You're right about the numbers. This looks more like a last-ditch effort or a simple act of defiance. I'd have waited longer to get our forces closer together. Amateurs, Hobart muttered. Miller's voice supplied updates every few seconds in a flat, unemotional tone. Units engaging. First wave, enemy casualties 50%. Second wave engaging. Second wave through, only two enemy units still extant. Deploying spikes. Field is now clear. Well, that was it. Unless Starfleet had a Cree battleship up their sleeve, we had a clear path to the target. Last chance, Commander, we might still save the autofactory. He shook his head. Not worth it. Too much risk of buried malware. Even your skippies couldn't guarantee a total cleansing. We'll rebuild. And the fact that it was the autofactory technically owned by the Bobiverse was undoubtedly a factor. I wondered if they'd have been so quick to ride it off if it had been the new home-owned equipment. At that moment, a harsh buzzer sound shattered the silence, and Miller's voice announced, Space station detonation, not our action, appears to be a self-destruct. Crap, I said. I turned to the commander. I'll examine the logs, and maybe we'll learn enough to avoid this next time. You back up ready? He shook his head. Twenty-four hours from go live. We didn't feel we could wait. We have individual small scut units with the necessary range, as I'm sure you do, but not enough to maintain full connectivity. We're essentially isolated from the rest of the UFS for a day. Hobart gave a humorless, perfunctory smile. No big deal from a practical point of view, but you know the big heads will have a collective fit. Can't block commerce and all that tripe. Yep, I rolled my eyes. That's okay, Commander. I think we're already at Max's doghouse. This won't add anything. 
Commander Hobart gave me a nod, then turned away and began giving orders to Miller. I took that as my cue and headed for the exit. I normally kept this Manny at the new home capital, a convenient location for interacting with the government or catching transit if I needed to go into town. However, knowing how this engagement might end, I decided to plan for getting the Manny off-planet. Howard had warned me that the very human tendency to want a scapegoat was making life uncomfortable for in-system bobs everywhere. My assets, those that were liquid anyway, had already been transferred via inter-system banking in transactions that couldn't be unwound. My physical assets were already heading out to the Urt by various paths. Once I reached my base there, I could work out my next step. As soon as I stepped out of the building, one of my cargo drones landed in front of me. Without breaking stride, I loaded myself in and ordered the drone to take off. I figured I had half an hour at the most before the government, the big heads as local slang called them, confiscated or nationalized or whatever euphemism you used for grabbed my assets. It was funny, but ever since the War of Independence on Poseidon, there'd been an unspoken agreement in the Bobiverse to not publish or otherwise publicize the existence of, or plans for, Sadar cloaking. I guess the mutual distrust had already been sown before Starfleet started inflating it. Or maybe their attitude was born of that distrust. The bottom line, though, was that once I got my equipment off-planet, they had no chance of finding it. It turned out I'd been a bit of a pessimist. It took almost three hours before an executive order was issued to secure all Bobiverse in-system assets, pending any assignment of legal liability. The order came with instructions for immediate action by the military and financial sector. It would take the suits most of a day to unwind the various blinds and dummy corps I'd set up in the last couple of days, at which point they'd find nothing but lint. The military aspect was a more immediate concern. Two squadrons pulled away from the LaGrange naval bases, accelerating at military-level Gs for my last known position and vector. Unfortunately for them, I'd already changed direction several times, so I was not only not at the projected position, I also didn't have a vector that was radial to it. Space was alive with Sudar pings, all sliding silently past my cloak. It took only a minute for Commander Hobart to come online. Claude Johansson, you are under military arrest per executive order of the big, uh, of the New Home Council. Cease acceleration and surrender yourself for boarding. I spared a moment to chuckle at Hobart's almost faux pas, but, of course, to respond would be to show my position. The commander was doomed to a frustrating day of explaining to the big heads why he'd come up empty-handed. I formatted an email and fired it off to Bill via my own SCUT-enabled relay. Not that he needed more headaches, but this was part of the big picture and would probably be replicated in other systems. I received a reply within seconds. No, not Mills. Seconds. He was that busy. Thanks for the info, Claude. Sadly, you're probably right about other systems trying the same thing, but I'll give any potentially affected Bobs the heads up. Nice move with the financial assets, by the way. I smiled, then sat back and stared into space. One way or another, I was probably finished in this system. Even if they decided they didn't need to sue me, I'd have a hard time arguing that I hadn't heard the commander and that all my chess moves were just normal business. Well, what the hell? I'd been stationary too long. Mario and his crew were finding interesting things out beyond the other's system. Maybe I'd join up and do my part to make known space a bigger place. 8. The Search Bob July 2334, Cedar Rapids. Hugh had cleaned up the spare Manny and was on the road. I was glad to have him active in Heaven's River. The thing with cloning versus transporting and the whole soul business was, I admit, freaky. I wondered if he'd decided to transport to Eta Leporis just to test it out for himself. 
I was in town, having arrived by land. A few casual conversations revealed that I was in a location that the translator handed off as Cedar Rapids. Local tree, of course. It was a prosperous town with a relatively large fleet of ships. It appeared that being the closest port to the mountains, and therefore the choke point for all goods coming from and going to the next segment of Heaven's River, was a good thing. There was another festival in full swing. I decided to wander around a little, see the sights, and get some of the flavor of the place. Hopefully, without my friends around, I would be just one more face in the crowd. And I would make a point of not peeking into any carts. In rapid succession, I saw a square dance group, a terrific string quartet, and a vocal group. The Quinlans definitely had a good sense of music and rhythm, but nothing was going to compensate for those short limbs. They would never do ballet or even hip-hop. I decided it might be prudent to check for signs of the resistance. I had come in overland and hadn't gone anywhere near the docks, so presumably I'd bypassed any lookouts. As casually as any random Quinlan, I picked the closest tavern and got a table. This one was significantly upscale, having an actual outdoor patio where one could eat, drink, and watch the world go by. However, a few minutes of watching made it clear that people seated there were not interested in socializing, so indoors it would be. I sidled up to the bar and ordered a beer and the local equivalent of a sandwich. It wasn't actual bread, maybe more of a pita wrap, but it had variations that didn't involve fish in its many forms. That alone made it my favorite snack. In between bites, I started to talk up the barkeep. It was a slow day, so she was bored enough to put up with me. Good lady, I am between residences at the moment. Could you recommend me a hotel or... Apartment overlooking the docks. Why, in Mother's name, would you want to live near the docks? Um, think fast, Bob. I'm an artist. Ships are my current subject of choice. She cocked her head, then nodded, deciding I wasn't dangerous or suspicious or something. My cousin Maurice is landlord of the Oaken Bale Luxury Apartments. Tell him Melanie sent you, and he'll find you something to your liking. And give you a kickback, no doubt. It was amazing just how much business was done in Heaven's River based on who knew a guy. But that was fine. It gave Melanie some motivation to help me out and to rationalize away any oddness. She gave me directions, and I thanked her and ordered another beer, just to be neighborly. I was going to play it cagey this time around, so I decided not to ask too many questions at any one location. Moving on to another tavern, I engaged a random bar fly in conversation. Say, I've got a cousin who is staying at the Oak and Bale Apartments. I haven't been able to find it. Can you help me out? Marty McBarfly chuckled. You must have been watching the ladies when you got here, my friend. You would have walked right by it as you left the docks. He examined me up and down speculatively. Your cousin must be from the more affluent side of the family. The oak and bale is not cheap. I laughed and tried to look embarrassed. I had a cover story ready, and as cover stories went, it wasn't bad. Gramps is hoping Theodore can find me a spot with some future prospects. Things are slow in Halep's ending. I watched him closely to see if the name meant anything. No luck. Theodore works at the library. Not that he needs the money. I could probably meet him there. Which one? Islands or Meat Hook? Oops. Uh, I confess I didn't pay that much attention. It's the one closest to his home, though. He hates walking. Islands, then. He gave me directions. I hope it works out well for you. Marty looked woefully at his empty mug. Taking the hint, I signaled for another round, and Marty's mood picked up. I had no intention of actually showing up at the library, any more than I intended to walk jauntily along the docks wearing a monocle, swinging my walking stick, and whistling Dixie. I needed to know if the resistance was still after me. If they had this town covered as well, then I had to accept that I was always going to be on their radar. I took a place in the Oak and Bale, and it really was expensive. I calculated that I'd burn through my cash in three months. 
Not that I planned to be here that long, but it was still worrying. If I had to, I could sell the knives, but I had a feeling that I wouldn't be able to get retail for them. After another long day of what I supposed could be considered spying, I popped into my VR library to find Hugh sitting back and drinking a coffee. He raised the cup in salute as I plopped into my lazy boy. How goes the battle, O、oh、great ancestor? I snickered in response, but I felt the old spidey sense tingle. Hugh's occasional attempts at bonhomie never really rang true. It wasn't an original Bob behavior, and the Skippies didn't strike me as having drifted into the glad-handing used car salesman domain. In movie terms, it was like he was leaning against the furniture and whistling while examining the ceiling. The question was, why? I've been watching the docks for several days. I replied, "There are a couple of guys who appear to spell each other, and they don't have an obvious function other than holding up walls. But that doesn't make them resistance." And if they are, they're not trying very hard. Probably just a general directive all the way up and down the segment to watch out for us. Well, you, maybe. What are you doing? Hugh pointed his finger at his chest. I am now a deckhand working a trading vessel that circuits the entire segment using all four main river systems. At the moment, we're working our way down the Arcadia River. Huh. That actually wasn't a terrible idea. He'd blend in with the crew. He'd have a lot of opportunity to talk and listen, and he'd be in a new town pretty much every day. Oh, and Bob, I recognized the tone of trouble. I cocked my head, trying to look as innocent as possible. I wonder if you could clarify something for me. It took a couple of days of my crewmates chortling every time they addressed me before I consciously listened to the Quinlan translation of my name. Innocent, straight face. I know nothing. Well, of course, the translation routine randomly assigns Quinlan names as required and associates them with a given English name. Random. Yep. He paused again. So the translator randomly, and completely by coincidence, assigned me the name Beer Can. Uh, yeah, pretty much. He stared at me, and I stared back, holding the straight face as long as I could. Finally, I broke. I started laughing and couldn't stop. Well, <laughs> Skippy, you—I could only squeeze out the occasional word between the guffaws. After a few moments, Hugh grinned, then started to laugh himself. Okay, he finally said, "It was funny, nicely done." But you do realize this means war. I grinned back at him. I guess you stuck with it, though. Yep. But I explained to my mates that it was a nickname originally meant as a joke, but that ended up sticking. I nodded in appreciation of the quick thinking. Have you learned anything in your travels, though? Nothing momentous. There's a general awareness of the existence of the administrator and the resistance, at least in the broadest terms. Many Quinlans are aware that they're living in an artificial megastructure and that they're being held at a specific technological level. For others, it's become somewhat mythologized, involving deities and demons and such. Either way, they mostly don't care. Really? Yeah. The thing is, life is pretty good. No one starves. There are no wars. Maybe the occasional intercity skirmish over fishing territory, but that's about it. Medical knowledge is good, and sanitation is well understood, so mortality is low. The truly huge predators that used to eat Quinlans are kept very low in numbers. Most people die from incurable illnesses, old age, fights, or other misadventures. It would be hard to come up with a good argument that would convince the average Quinlan to get worked up about the situation. He looked like he was about to say more than cut himself off. This just reinforced my growing suspicion that Hugh was holding out on me in some way. But whether it was significant or just some. Wacko theory that he wasn't ready to share. Okay, I said. I've about exhausted my options in Cedar Rapids. No one has heard of Halep's ending, and unless I march through town carrying a sign announcing myself, I don't think I'm going to have any kind of run-in with either the resistance or the administrator. There's a transit station a little way down river, so I think I'm going to go there and try to break in. 
You're turning into a real juvenile delinquent, Hughes said with a grin. Well, have fun. 9. A Declaration of War Will, July 2334, UFS Council Session I was touring one of the new experimental open-air towns on Valhalla when I got a message on my heads up. The UFS had just called an emergency session. That would have been significant news at any time, but right now with the Starfleet issue, it almost certainly meant trouble. The bios would take time to get to communicators, so I didn't feel the need to seat my Manny on the nearest surface and leave it. Instead, I turned up the horses and sprinted to a green space where I could find a bench to plant my butt on. Within minutes, the Manny was seated in an Adirondack chair, and I was in vert waiting for the session to start. While I waited, I read the prepared statement from the Pangean Council. At 8.30 yesterday, Standard Time, the Pangea Navy engaged with devices controlled by a faction of the Bobiverse, commonly referred to disparagingly as Starfleet. These devices were illegally coordinating our communication station with a stated intent of using it as a bargaining chip for extortion against our government. Our forces carried the battle, but the enemy, possibly in a fit of pique, destroyed the hostage systems. In addition, our attempts to recover control of the Pangea system auto factories were met with the same response. We are now in the precarious situation of having lost half our manufacturing capability and virtually all our communications with the rest of the UFS. There is no acceptable justification for these actions. Accordingly, the Pangean Council has declared war against the group known as Starfleet. To the extent possible, all Starfleet assets will be identified and confiscated. Commerce or communication with Starfleet operatives by Pangea citizens will be considered illegal and will be punishable under the War Measures Act. The missive went on for several more paragraphs, but didn't add much to the central takeaway. Pangea was officially at war. I pulled up some background documents to get details. The colony had tried to access the comm station and do a manual reset, and it had self-destructed. No one was killed, but there was significant damage to a couple of ships. The administration had then tried to do the same with their one LaGrange-based auto factory and had been set upon by mining drones and roamers. Except for the order of the explosions, it was a virtual repeat of the New Holm engagement. This was not good, never mind the obvious issues. Starfleet had endangered human lives by blowing up stations. Even if they hadn't actively pushed the button, just booby-trapping them like that made Starfleet culpable. In their rush to sever ties with bios, they'd undertaken strategies that were just making the bios mad and ensuring more interaction, and not the good kind. These guys were really idiots. I mean, seriously common sense challenged. A ding indicated that the session was about to start. I set the data window aside and paid attention. The chair took the floor and proceeded to read the prepared statement verbatim. No new info there, and I began to squirm with impatience. Finally, the chair ran down, having contributed nothing that I could detect, and ceded the floor to the representative from Pangea. Representative he stood and glared around. It was showmanship, of course. He was facing a video window the same as the rest of us. But it was well executed. You felt you'd just been examined, judged, and dismissed. I won't belabor the events described in the Pangean statement, he began. Suffice it to say, blowing up Pangean property and placing the lives of our citizens in danger is a de facto act of war. He paused for effect. We accept the explanation from the Bobiverse about the splinter group known as Starfleet. I will leave for another day the question of whether this is symptomatic of a more general and long-term issue of risk in continuing to have diplomatic and economic relations with what is essentially a separate species, a non-biological species at that, one whose capabilities and ultimate goals are not known. Uh-oh... He wasn't just going after Starfleet. We have to this point been unable to reacquire control of the L-5 space yards. Since the strategic situation can only deteriorate as the enemy consolidates their position, we have decided to take early and decisive action. 
as I speak, a number of tactical nuclear devices have been deployed. By the time we are finished with this discussion, the Pangean Spaceyard Auto Factory will be no more. Representative he paused to do the sweeping glare thing again. Doubtless it will have occurred to everyone that this loss, and the loss of our primary commercial auto factory yesterday, will affect our economic outlook. Let me assure you that we have planet-based resources sufficient to replace the space-borne assets within a local year. He now stared straight into the camera, an action that felt like it was directed at me. However, we will not forget this event, and there will be consequences. A few more representatives gave speeches, just because they felt they had to. Then the council held a vote to support Pangea's use of nukes. It passed. The situation at Newholm had been a major topic of discussion in the Bobiverse for several solid minutes. This, on top of what had already gone down, meant we were at real risk. Financially, that is. Bobs hadn't been inclined to leave themselves physically vulnerable since the Matt War on Poseidon. A fair number of in-system heaven vessels were actually decoys nowadays, while Bobs parked themselves way the hell out in the Urt. Howard had volunteered to shelter such assets as could be transferred to him. He had a lot of connections in a huge business empire and owned large swatches of meat space, more than the buyers realized. A frontal assault would not go well for them. Finally, the session wound down. With a sigh, I disconnected. My little side project was beginning to look less and less like a casual bit of vanity and more like a potential end game. It might be time to talk to Neil and Herschel. 10. Catching the Train Bob, July 2334, Transit. I examined the station using telescopic vision. In outward appearance, it was identical to the one outside Garrick's spine. Probably the artwork would be different, but from this distance, I couldn't see the interior. I had a decision to make. If crew and any resistance double agents used the vacuum monorail, it stood to reason they had to be able to get into the transit station. If they could get in, but the riffraff couldn't, they needed some way to identify themselves. I fingered the security pass in my hand. It was all very logical, but even in a human-built environment, it wouldn't be a sure thing. Or I could be right with my logic, but this card might not be for transit. Trying to get into the station using a library card would surely be unsuccessful and probably get me noticed. And what about facial recognition? Had they implemented a matching system? Would the systems compare my mug with a picture on file, which was probably Natasha's? If so, and I failed the match, which I would, what would happen? Legions of crab-like drones assaulting me? Air horns? On the other hand, my alternative was to dig my way into the station the same way Gandalf and company had dug out, but... With only one-inch roamers, that could take a while. I decided I'd save that option for last. I compared my face with Natasha's in my memory, then for completeness compared some other random Quinlan faces. Facial recognition software, at least the Terran version, didn't do a full recognition the way a person would. The computer match was done by comparing the spatial relation between significant and easily recognizable points on the face, like pupils, ends of the mouth, nostrils, point of the chin, and so forth. This simplified algorithm saved a lot of processing time and was good enough for most purposes. A brief survey of my memories of Quinlan's identified a similar set of likely key locations on the Quinlan face. How much flexibility did my Manny have in that area? They were built using the same skeletal and muscular design as the biological versions, but the Mannies also had internal repair systems that could be ordered around. Plus, muscles could be flexed in unnatural ways, if necessary. I remembered Will's comment that once the administration had a mugshot of me, I'd never be off their radar. 
Maybe, just for safety, I should take the time to look into this. I sent a quick message to Bill and received a reply almost immediately. Really busy, Bob. Check with the Borg if you need a quick answer. Hmm. Definitely not what I was looking for. Nevertheless, I forwarded the message to Locutus and received a response within a minute. The design came with editable parameters. Some are fixed at print time, but some are what I suppose we could call mechanical settings. You should have a certain level of adjustability. I've attached specs and instructions. Much better. I read the instructions, reviewed my requirements, and sent orders to internal systems. I could feel my face contorting. It wasn't painful, but it felt like something was crawling under my skin and made me want to dance around, yelling, Gah! In seconds, it was done. I spit up a spider to take a selfie with. Hmm. Not perfect, but very likely within the margins of error. I took a figurative deep breath, stood and marched toward the front door of the transit station, trying to look like I belonged there. The main entranceway, a roll-up door of barn size, didn't present me with any obvious manner of getting in. I was probably on camera by this point, but I doubted that standing and staring was considered a crime. Just off around the side, though, was a normal-sized door, probably for maintenance people or whatever, and glory be. This entrance had one of those flat plates beside it for scanning security cards. It continued to amaze me how totally plebeian and boringly similar most tech turned out to be. The moment of truth. I placed the card against the plate and deliberately avoided looking around. There was a click, and I pulled the door open. Success! And no crab hordes! I was going to have to wing it a little bit, as I'd be going where no Bob had gone before, but presumably my every step wasn't being monitored. I walked up to the elevators, pressed the only button, and a door opened with a ding. I entered and pressed the button labeled Transit. After a short ride, the doors opened on a corridor stretching off into the distance. This had very much a public area kind of feeling, and my confidence increased as I progressed. At the end of the corridor, the space opened up to some kind of vestibule or maybe train platform. Along the far wall were a series of evenly spaced, identical doors, looking something like airlocks. Between each set of doors was a card reader panel. At a loss as to what else to do, I pressed Natasha's card against one. A voice spoke into my ear. Destination. Okay, moment of truth. Halep's ending? One moment. A short pause. A train will arrive in 168 seconds. Holy moly jackpot. 168 seconds was the English translation. The actual amount quoted was one and a half vex, the Quinlan equivalent to minutes. Gotta love translators. But the important takeaway was that Halep's ending existed. It was on the route listings, and I was going there. For the first time since this adventure started, I felt Bender was actually within reach. 11. The War in Meat Space Will, July 2334, UFS Council Session I read the message in my heads up twice, hoping that I'd misunderstood. Nope. The Romulus World Gov had just preemptively nuked the local space-based auto factories. I supposed after the new home and Pangea experiences, they kind of had a point. I sighed and ordered the roamers to begin cleaning up my work area. I wasn't going to be getting more work done on this water filter design anytime soon. The roamers would take care of putting everything away, so I walked over to a convenient Adirondack chair and made myself comfortable, then exited my Manny. I immediately connected to the UFS Council channel and signed in. As expected, discussion of the nuking was in process at full volume. Representative Ella Cranston, the granddaughter of my old nemesis, had the floor. And no... We will not be compensating the Bobaverse for the loss of their assets. Let's not forget where the threat is coming from. In fact, if this becomes an ongoing issue, I will move to demand compensation 
from the Bobaverse for our losses, both equipment and productivity. We've lost billions because of the economic volatility, never mind direct costs. At this time, we are negotiating with our neighbors on Vulcan to pass legislation mandating only human-owned and operated auto factories in the Omicron-squared Eridni system. She went on for considerable time, but the upshot was that all Bobiverse equipment in their system would be deactivated or nuked forthwith. They would be replacing the relay station with their own unit, which we were welcome to use as paying customers just like everyone else. Well, that was something. The Pangaea colony was talking about cutting us off completely and treating us like an untrusted foreign power. To be fair, they'd had the worst experience with Starfleet's strategies, so I couldn't blame them. A ding indicated a private conference request. It was from Representative Ben Hendricks, one of our descendants. That alone made him one of my favorite people. The fact that he was conscientious, ethical, and dedicated was just a bonus. I pressed accept, and his face came up. Will, the agreement with Vulcan will almost certainly go through. The bobs are going to be all but tossed out of the system. Is there anything we can do? It's not that bad, Ben. I made a calm-down motion with my hand. The Bobiverse is the single biggest user of the relay stations, since everything we do is via SCUT. Omicom's LLC will no doubt be taking over completely in Omicron Squared Eridni, and they'll want to keep us as a customer, whatever the government mouthpieces are threatening. Plus, we're a major shareholder, so we could force the issue. Ben smiled and nodded. As the owners of the communications and production systems for many years, the Bobiverse had accumulated huge wealth in the human economy, almost without trying. It was quite possible, in fact, that resentment of that fact was fueling at least some of the glee with which the humans were dismantling things. My real concern, I continued, is the talk of restricting Manny use. It's pointless, as we'd still be able to do business by video call, but it would socially isolate us. I've got our lawyers working the human rights angle. And the government is contesting your right to be considered human, Ben replied. Yeah, faith, all over again, even if they aren't calling themselves that anymore. I frowned. I don't think they can win that, Ben, unless they just start ignoring laws and daring us to do anything about it. I think that would take us and them down a road... I don't want to speculate on. Ben nodded. Uh-huh. It would be a constitutional crisis, at minimum. I brought up the volume on Cranston's rant for a moment, then turned it down and smiled. Looks like her signal-to-noise ratio has dropped to zero. I'm going to keep a low profile on this, unless she and her allies go off the deep end. Keep me updated, okay? Ben nodded again and gave me a wave. I closed the conference, signed off the council session, and sat back. It wasn't likely that any colony government would be able to ban Manny's outright. Lobbyist groups representing the replicant preserve companies, along with rich people who had signed up for replication, would bring a lot of pressure to bear. But the pattern was worrying. Replicant resentment plus Starfleet war plus PAV threat plus all the rumors circulating about the Quinlans were proving to be too much for the average human citizen. With too many threats from too many directions, Joe Average wanted to circle the wagons. We'd spent a hundred years setting up a single galactic government that would provide some safety and stability for all sentience. And now it was unraveling. Ugh. As if I needed reminding of why I hated politics. Twelve. Halep's Ending. Bob, July 2334, Heaven's River. There was a subtle vibration through the floor, followed a few moments later by one set of doors opening. The train for Halep's ending has arrived, the voice said in my ear. The train will be leaving in 112 seconds. I walked through the open doorway. A short airlock section ended in another set of doors, which opened into what was presumably my train. Certainly it had that long, tube-like train shape. There were no windows, but there were rows of comfortable-looking seats. 
I glanced over my shoulder and realized that the row of doors at the end of the platform connected to matching doors on the train with two sets of doors leading into each car. Very much like a subway. All in all, it seemed very civilized. I studied the area at the back of the car and realized it held a washroom. The same sign on the door was used in every town in Heaven's River and a small vendor kiosk. There was a sign on the shuttered window that said, The snack bar is closed until further notice. I was staring at the sign in a state of slightly disbelieving amusement when the train voice said, Please be seated. Doors will close in eleven seconds. Acceleration will last three hundred thirty-six seconds. After that point, passengers may move around the train. I took the nearest seat and settled back. It was comfortable and included accommodation for the Quinlan tail. There were some controls on the armrest and speakers in the headrest. Quinlan's traveled in style. But in principle, a passenger might have to travel up to a half billion miles in Heaven's River. How would that work? Excuse me, train voice? May I be of assistance? How long to Halep's ending? 3,814 miles. No. Okay, granted, I'd phrase that wrong. How much time will this trip to Halep's ending take? Approximately 6,244 seconds, including acceleration and deceleration. About 2,200 miles per hour. At that speed, it would take a lifetime to travel around the Topopolis. What is the longest trip one could take in terms of distance? The edge of the observable universe is approximately 45.7 billion light-years away. Sigh. What is the longest trip one could take on the Heavens River train system in terms of distance? A trip to Grendel, which is opposite this point on Heavens River, would be approximately 499,720,000 miles. How long would that trip take on this train? You would not take that trip on this train. Grrr. How would I take that trip? You would take an express train equipped with staterooms and sleeping berths. And how long would the trip take? Approximately twelve days. The express trains travel faster? Express trains travel on the high-speed trunks and achieve a maximum velocity of 527 miles per second. Interestingly precise speed. I did a quick calculation and realized that such a speed would result in one standard Quinlan G of pseudo-gravity as the train traveled around the Topopolis. Except the train would also be corkscrewing counter to the rotation of the habitat, which explained the helical track that Professor Gilligan had described. Anyway, at the moment I was on a local run which would operate at much lower speeds. Well, I had a couple of hours with nothing to do. Which direction is Halep's ending? It is in front of us. I bit back an expletive. Which direction is Halep's ending relative to Garak's spine? It is sunward. I had to think about that for a moment and check the translation specs. Sunward meant the direction that the artificial sun moved, so west, according to our conventions. Can you tell me about the area around Halep's ending? Specifics are not available. There is an information kiosk at the station that can provide local details. Uh-huh, except it was probably closed until further notice. Sadly, the train voice probably only had information directly related to trains and train schedules, and asking all kinds of weird questions might get me flagged. Can you inform me when we're close to arrival? I will set a wake-up call for 224 seconds before deceleration. Is that acceptable? Uh, yes, thank you. Meanwhile, I would put the Manny on standby and have a nap, which would allow me to get some work done. They really had this stuff all worked out, didn't they? Will said. 
Stephen pointed out the helical layout of the express tubes. He even suggested why they exist. The helical track exactly cancels out the rotation of the megastructure as the train travels through it, and the speed of the train around the long radius is calibrated to replace the lost artificial gravity of the shell rotation. Nice. I grinned at Will's reaction. That response was one I'd normally expect more from Bill, but, as always, Bob is Bob. Yep. So I'll be at Halep's ending soon, and I'll head for the nearest mountains. If the segments are reasonably standardized, and there's no reason to think otherwise, the entrance shouldn't be too hard to find. The question, though, is whether Natasha's pass card will work 4,000 miles away, and whether I dare try it and risk alarms going off. We were interrupted by the train voice playing into my VR through the Manny Link. We are approaching your destination. Will levered himself out of the beanbag chair. I guess that's your curtain call, he waved and popped out. I entered the Manny and blinked my eyes, feigning, waking up. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the train? Not at this time. What does the train do if there are no passengers requiring transport? The train will remain at the last stop until called. Interesting. So, unless someone in Halep's Ending needs a train, I might have a getaway vehicle waiting for me. My ruminations were interrupted as my seat began to rotate in place. I glanced around to see that all the seats were doing the same. It answered a question that had been in the back of my mind about how deceleration would be handled. I wondered what acceleration and deceleration would be like in one of the express trains, probably a lot longer. It seemed likely that they had acceleration couches separate from the berths and staterooms. The train came to a stop and the doors swooshed open. The train voice said, May you travel with Mother's blessing. I didn't know what the proper response was, so I just said, Thank you. This station was identical to the last one, so leaving was almost like playing the video in reverse. Except, as expected, the art was different. And naturally, my mind went there. A billion miles of Topopolis is a hundred million transit stations. No, scratch that. Four hundred million if they followed each of the four rivers. Either the Quinlans produced a lot of art, or there would be duplications. I wondered for a moment if there was an art mill somewhere with Quinlans churning out statues and paintings. I headed for the same side door, which only required pushing on a latch bar from this side, and just like that I was out, in the weather. Specifically, it was raining. Not a lashing, raging storm. We hadn't seen any of that kind of out-of-control cage match stuff the whole time we'd been here. My theory was that it would cause undue erosion and therefore extra work for the maintenance critters. And anyway, I figured weather in an artificial environment would tend to be mild, predictable, and controlled. Still, I was getting rained on, which wouldn't bother a Quinlan, but irked my human-raised brain. And I wouldn't be able to smell a stream in this mess. Sulking loudly, I marched off toward the town in the near distance. It was interesting that all the transit stations were outside of towns. And it wasn't like the towns or the stations had been moved. The towns were on the best possible spot on the river, so that was doubtless where they were supposed to be. The stations? Well, how would you move them? Perhaps this was a Quinlan psychological thing. They couldn't be like humans in everything. Maybe they didn't like transit stations up in their face or something. It was just one of many, many questions that we were accumulating and might or might not get answers to someday. It was very late in the day and was beginning to get dark. I probably wasn't in danger from the local wildlife, but I would have to stop moving if I wanted to avoid their attentions. A bed in town sounded best. I dropped to all fours and put on some speed. Renting a room was an experience. I was beginning to get a hint of why Bridget had decided on a sabbat as our cover. Sabbats were common, and there was a whole section of the economy dedicated to servicing that particular market segment. Single travelers, though, not so much. I had to try three hotels before I found a vacancy. I would tweaked my features slightly, preferring to mix it up rather than constantly walk around with the same face. I was up early the next morning... 
not bothering with breakfast or the accompanying breakfast beer. Yuck. I headed straight for the river. The mountains were only a few miles away, and swimming would get me there much faster than a land approach. I decided to deliberately overshoot the estimated location of the entrance, preferring to approach it from behind in case there were surveillance cameras. Again, I had to assume that the habitat had been set up with normal levels of civilian security in mind, rather than a military defensive strategy. Cameras would probably be limited to surveilling the road up to the gate. Assuming I wasn't all wet with my deductions, then the habitat would have been originally designed not to hide the entrance from the populace, but to hide it from view, to maintain the illusion. Also, the entrance wouldn't be too hard to get to for staff. That would put it as close as possible to the river, consistent with the rising land providing space for an underground maintenance complex, because Quinlan's. It would also almost certainly have at least some kind of basic security, so... I wouldn't be able to just walk up and turn the handle, but that's what roamers were for, right? I swam upstream until I was at the point where arable land ended and pseudo-rock started. Up close, I could tell the material of the mountains was clearly not natural rock. In fact, it had somewhat the consistency of volcanic pumice, probably an engineered version, and probably lightweight, since that would matter in the rotating shell. The coloration was artificial and designed to resemble random terrain from a distance. Then I floated slowly downstream, hugging the shore, examining the rock, looking for something, and lo and behold, I found something. Pumice is hard, but it's light because it's mostly air bubbles, and it wears. I don't know how many generations of Quinlans had been using this particular path to the water, but it was enough to have worn it smooth. I grinned to myself and climbed out of the water. Success. Well, probably success. One additional concern would be whether or not the resistance had set up surveillance of the entrance. They might or might not allocate someone to the task. They might or might not use electronic means. Of course, too much of that might tip off the administrator, so they might stay as low-tech as possible. In my mind, Vizzini started gibbering. I was going around in circles again. Inconceivable, I muttered. At some point, you had to pick. I decided on boldness. I spit out all my spiders and directed them to examine the area around and in front of me as I advanced. Within a minute, the trail terminated at a blank wall. No cameras in evidence. I thought of the mines of Moria and muttered, friend, with a grin. No effect, of course. Tolkien had no power here. Romers did, though. I ordered the spiders to do a close-in survey and released my fleas as well. My devices would find everything there was to be found, and meanwhile, I would get some sun. It was late afternoon, and the sun was disappearing behind the mountains, creating a premature local dusk, when one of my fleas reported a find. A small design glitch had caused a stress fracture where the pumice layer was only an inch or so deep over the underlying structure. The flea had found a ventilation tube and was asking permission to cut into it. I granted permission and sent the other fleas in to help. The thing about security doors is that no matter how much electronics you add, in the end there's a latch connected to a mechanical linkage actuated by a magnet or motor powered by electricity, which is controlled by a switch. And the Romer design included the capability to act as a conductor, if necessary, without frying the unit. Very handy for circuit testing and repair, and for espionage, as it turns out. My devices also found a sensor that would report the opening and closing of the door. That was a simple fix. One of the fleas jammed the sensor for the duration by simply welding the moving part. The door opened. However, without the sensor operating, the lights didn't come on, so I was looking at a dim corridor, which would turn pitch black once the door closed. Infrared vision would help some, but I'd still have to go slow. As soon as I started walking, though, lights came on. Motion sensors. Hopefully all they did was control the lighting. With a sigh, I accepted that I simply wasn't going to be able to plan for and control everything. As usual, winging it would form a large percentage of my strategy. 
I instructed my spiders to precede me down the corridor, walking along the walls and ceiling, and to warn me of upcoming booby traps, cameras, trip wires, acid pits, hordes of goblins and or orcs, or pretty much anything not suitable for afternoon tea. The corridor led to an elevator bank. Of course it did, because nothing says stealth like taking the elevator down to the secret lair. Ding, fourth floor. 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 Ding.